Connie didn't want her cell phone to be up there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, so how many of you guys are familiar with this pair, right? I mean, you know these guys, right? They're Saturday morning uh, staples for most of us growing up, and I love watching these guys who get up early in the morning, run down the stairs, and 8 o'clock in the morning, watch that on Saturday. But did you know that there is a written set of rules down that governs and applied to every single episode of this pair, the Roadrunner and Wild and Coyote? Did you know that? There was. Um, I learned this when I was studying for this, this chapter in the book Master, so it's not original to me, but I love the analogy, so I borrowed it from a guy named Landon Dowden, giving him credit for it. But um, so really what the brilliant Chuck Jones did was he came up with this list of rules and there was no deviation from these rules in any of the episodes that we watched every Saturday morning. And there's a picture of the rules. I know you can't read that, uh, but this is a snapshot of the rules taken at the exhibition of Chuck Jones animation. And just a couple of them say, uh, the roadrunner cannot harm the coyote except by going beep beep. And no outside force can harm the coyote, only his own ineptitude or failure of the acting product. And whenever possible, may gravity the coyote's greatest enemy. And the last one was the coyote is always more humiliated than harmed by his failure. So we're up to chapter seven in our book, in the book of Esther. And if you're reading along with us, you might have noticed some similarities as I'm reading this, as I'm reading this between the coyote's rule book and our villain in the story, Haman, right? Think about it. Verse one, Mordecai uh, was act no actual threat to Haman, was he? Uh, he, just like the roadrunner, uh, who only said beep, beep to, uh, uh, to the coyote, Haman was goaded on by the mere presence of Mordecai. Mordecai didn't actually do anything to him. It's just he wouldn't bow to him, so his mere presence there uh, kept pushing him further to more and more extreme behavior. In fact, last week we saw in the, this vendetta kind of came to a head when he tried to uh, execute him. And the second one here is that just like in the cartoons in the real life story of Haman, nothing was forcing Haman down this path. Uh, it was his impatience, his ability to justify himself, and uh, that pushed him continually down this road, even with the warning of his family and friends told him to stop. Uh, his ineptitude in seeing the folly of this behavior is what led uh, to his demise and tripped him up. And so, like I said, Mordecai was uh, number three. Mordecai was not Haman's enemy, neither was Esther or the Jews. Haman's greatest enemy was his own sin. And the gravity of his pride and self-obsession and his lust for power that he had it was just like the anvil that pulled the coyote off the side of the cliff so many times. And here's where the similarity ends, uh, that the coyote is never really hurt by uh, his, his folly and his chasing the, the, the uh, road runner. He gets black and blue, he dusts himself off, and then he lives to chase him again. But for, the tra uh, for Haman, the trap that he so carefully constructed for Mordecai ended up springing on himself to his own demise. So the big here, the big picture here is uh, that just like the rules that Chuck Jones made for the coyote uh, to, to kept him from getting the uh, roadrunner, God made some rules a long time ago. And these rules were in the form of a covenant with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. And these were enacted way before Esther and Mordecai and Haman showed up on the scene. And the covenant that God made with with Abraham said that no one, nobody, uh, and nothing would harm his covenant people. And so in uh, the moment that Haman set his sights on destroying the Jews, um, he was doomed because he was fighting against God. And that's kind of a summation of what Esther chapter 7 is, but we're going to take a walk through this chapter so you'll understand. And just like I do every week, I give you a quick recap in case you weren't here last time and you're just jumping in here. So you remember last time when we left off that the king could not sleep, right? And we found out that that was the pivotal point of the entire book of Esther. And what we learned was that God uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. And we see this so very carefully, clearly in the unfolding of these last two chapters, chapter 6 and chapter 7. 
And I hope that you started to think after last week how God has been working in your life and the details of your life, how you can look back over and see these pivotal points in your lives where God worked uh, through an invitation from somebody, a conversation with somebody, something that came to you, how God just shifted and changed and directed you toward his will. And so, um, and, but as a result of this bout with insomnia, the king, uh, he... He um, had the record of his kingdom read to him, and what he found out was that Mordecai had saved him from an assassination plot, but nothing had ever been done to, to, um, to, to honor him. And so he, as soon as he realizes this, he uh, sets out to uh, fix this oversight, and you know, he calls Haman in, who was in the middle of the night out in the, in the, in the uh, waiting, room, uh, waiting area outside the king's courtroom, Remember, timing is really important in this part of the chapter. That the, that um, So he just shows up in the middle of the night, and he says, come in. And he says, "Who? what should I do for someone that the king wants to honor? And so Haman is so caught up in his self-obsession that he thinks the king's talking about him. And so he rattles off this whole list of stuff that he wants, only to be surprised that the king is actually talking about Mordecai. So Haman ends up having to honor Mordecai. And he was the one who led him through the streets for everybody's accolades, and he was humiliated by this. And at the end of the chapter, we find out that his family and friends go, okay, this is not just coincidence. If God is on the side of Mordecai the Jew, then you're going to fail. You need to quit this vendetta. But before, uh, uh, before this, he can really say anything or he can process through this, the, the king's eunuch shows up, and this is once again timing here because he doesn't have time to process through it, he doesn't have time to think through it and come up with a new, another plan because Haman's really slimy and he's really good at manipulating things, but he doesn't have time to think. The king, you're not going to keep the king and queen waiting, so he's whisked him off to Esther's second banquet. And so uh, let's get to the verses for tonight, see what happens. And so verse 1 says that the king and Haman went to die with Queen Esther. As they were drinking wine on that second day, the king asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. So notice there's two questions there. What is your petition and what is your request? Remember we talked about before, uh, even up to half the kingdom is not literal. He's not making her co-regent or co-ruler with him. He's just saying that I'm predisposed to be generous toward you. And so uh, she says... If I have found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life, this is my petition, answers first question, and spare my people, this is my request. So, um, so she, by answering these two questions with the request is the life uh, of my life, and the others is to grant my people their life, she has lumped her destiny in with the whole Jewish population keeps going. She says, for I and my people, she's now identified herself with the Jewish population, have been sold for destruction, slaughter, and annihilation. So by using the word sold here, Esther implies that someone has stepped in to undermine the king's authority and to do damage to his kingdom. Now this is the same strategy that Haman used to get the edict passed in the first place. Remember that this is for the good of your kingdom. You need to do this. There's this group of people, and they're different, and they have different customs, and so you need to get rid of them because it's going to damage your kingdom for them to stay. So she basically turns this around on him and implies that someone has threatened the kingdom again. And the implication is, king, do you know what someone is trying to do to you? Do you know what's going on behind your back? Someone is trying to wrestle this power away from you by selling off part of your kingdom. And it becomes then a threat against the king. And so she's got his full attention now. Now remember that this is less than a full day since he's been reminded of the very real threats that existed to the king of Persia because he's read in the record of of, the, of his kingdom about the, the threat that Mordecai exposed. So he's got it in his mind. Yes, this is a threat. I need to pay attention. Something else might be going on here. Esther's basically pointing out another plot against him. Now she uses the words destruction, slaughter, and annihilation. And those are exactly the same three words uh, used by in the edict by Haman. So apparently Xerxes doesn't recognize this right off the bat. 
maybe he's not really paying attention, uh, or he wasn't paying attention enough when, he, when Haman came up with this idea um, uh, to have it register as, if we're talking about the same thing now, uh, but she is laying a trap for Haman with, use, by using these words, and he has to be catching on by now because he's going to recognize these words even though the king doesn't, but he can't interrupt a queen and he can't, it, because this is a conversation between the two of them. And so then she goes on, she says, if we had nearly been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. Now, she's smooching him a little bit here, uh, but the point is that she's trying to pull Xerxes in closer to her. And what she's saying here is that she values the king's peace of mind equally as much as her own uh, freedom. And it just meant that she would be going to slavery then she wouldn't have even bothered him at all. Um, so, I mean, after five years of being in the court with him, she knows what it's like for him. He's very volatile. And so saying that she cares about him, about his well-being, about how he is responding to this, is telling him that he's the most important person in the room and in the conversation and what's going on here. And now by couching this whole thing in the context of being sold into slavery, she's building into this a way for the king to be left off the hook, let off the hook. Now, this is really important because who actually gave permission for this edict to go into effect? It's the king, right? It's like, yes, it was written by Haman. Yes, it was concocted by Haman. And even the signet ring was given to Haman. But because it can't carries the king's stamp of approval, this is the king's rule. This is the king's law. And she's uh, basically, Esther's really basically realized now that. Uh, Haman might come into this and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, king. She doesn't really know what's going on here, your highness. This is a law that she doesn't understand, and she doesn't know what's going on here. And this might be a conundrum that Haman could spin this around for. And so she realizes she cannot make Xerxes look foolish or weak because that would undermine the whole thing. So by saying the people have been sold... She's implying that Haman has manipulated the king's approval. Now, see, the word Haman used um, for destroy back in chapter 3 when he wrote this, this edict here is very similar sounding to the word enslave in that language. So Esther here implies that someone has deceived the king into thinking that he wanted to sell some people into the kingdom, uh, uh, sell, them into, sell them into slavery instead of kill them. Um, that would explain why Xerxes is kind of clueless in what's going on here. It seems like he is. But now whether he didn't know, he didn't pay attention, or he didn't care is really irrelevant to what's going on here. Because what she's done here is built a way to give Xerxes a way out without looking weak and without looking foolish. And at the same time, compounded Haman's guilt because he's not only threatened the queen, but he's manipulated Xerxes to do it. So the way Esther phrases this is actually really brilliant, and I'm pretty sure this is right here is what came from the three nights of fasting and prayer. That she didn't just barge in there, she didn't just blurt it out, but as she fasted, as she prayed, as she submitted herself to God, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that God gave her the skill to present this very carefully. And Xerxes has started grasping what's going on here. But still has some confusion here as he starts to demand answers. So the reality of what happens starts to take hold. Now his anger is starting to build. And so someone has put a plot against him. So here's what he says. He asks Queen Esther, who is he? Where is the man who had dared do such a thing? And Esther responds, uh, strip away the facade that uh, Haman has constructed. She says, this adversary and the enemy is this vile Haman. And then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. No joke, right? <laughs> I mean, he, 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 um, so notice how the, this is written here, that they don't even, uh, that it, the writer it doesn't put it as Xerxes and Esther here, but by saying the king and queen is joining them two together, opposite of Haman. So there's now these two on this side and Haman over there. So then... He, the king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. So he's so enraged now that he can't think straight. He has just learned that his right-hand man, the guy he trusted the most, 
has plotted against him and manipulated him, and he has to be so angry at potentially looking like a weak ruler as a result of this. I mean, how this plays out in the next news cycle is of supreme importance to him. And so he stomps out in a fury to try to clear his head, to try to come up with, now what do I do, basically? So Haman has been right allowed, allowed, <laughs> around long enough to know what happens when the king gets angry. And it even says in verse 8, at the end of verse 7 and 8, that Haman knew what the king had already decided about his fate and stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. And then we have another timing thing coming up. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. Now let me tell you what's going on here. So reclining was the customary way to eat a meal in the Persian Empire, if you're wondering what she's doing laying on the couch eating dinner. Uh, but the more important, important point to notice here is that harem protocol was super specific during this time. And it's really key to understand what was going on here uh, because no one but the king was allowed to be near the queen except for the eunuchs who took care of them. Nobody else. And in fact, uh, if, uh, you know, even when he was present, no one could be within seven steps of the queen except him. And so that, uh, um, so Haman should have either followed the king out or excused himself from her presence until the king came back in. And we don't really get this in our culture in our day, but uh, it, this was that he would actually approach her and actually touch where she was lying was inappropriate in the extreme. And it may have even been that, been that because he was begging, and he was begging for his life, that he would have gone up and tried to touch her knees because that's the way that you would beg before somebody was to grasp their knees. So this shows the level of desperation that Haman felt at this moment. Uh, he knew what was coming from Xerxes and broke all the rules of decency and decorum in order to plead his case. So you get the ironic picture here right now. The big thing with Haman during this whole story is that he is upset because a Jew won't bow to him. And now we have a picture of him bowing and grasping at the knees of the Jew begging for his life. So this is a complete reversal here. And so Haman is so up close to Esther, basically falling onto the couch where she is and where she reclined, you can imagine this was also a shock to Esther, right? So she's been used to, for five years, nobody comes close to me. And here's this guy who's in a panic, desperate panic, rushing toward her, so she no doubt recoils back from him, right? At the very time when Xerxes comes into the room and sees what's happened, and he basically blows a gasket, right? <laughs> and the king says, will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? So you can imagine how loud he was screaming at this point, red-faced. So the quandary about what do I do about uh, Haman is solved now. He doesn't have to worry about how do I explain why I just killed my, my number two man. He's not going to have to say anything about that because this affront to the king and the court protocol was enough in itself to warrant him to be executed, and that's exactly what happens. And so as soon as the word left his mouth, the king's mouth, they cover Haman's face. So what this is is that a condemned criminal was unworthy to look on the face of the king any longer. So the first thing they would do with a king, with a, with a condemned person, is cover their face with a shroud or a, 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 you know, a piece of cloth or something so they couldn't look at the king anymore. And so that's what we have here. And then Harbona, we saw him back in chapter 1, one of the king's eunuchs attending the king. He, he's like, okay, I'm not with him anymore. <laughs> I'm with you, king. And he's like, okay, by the way, uh, let me tell you that a 75-foot gallows stands behind Haman's house. You know what? He made it for Mordecai, who spoke up on your behalf. <laughs> and so the king is like, okay, hang him on it. And that's exactly what happens. And... Um, and so they hang Haman on the gallows and he's prepared for Mordecai and the king's fury subsided and, as, and um, so this is once again one uh, amazing irony here the one who tried so hard to elevate himself uh, is now elevated on a 75 foot gallows on the very instrument of torture that he cre uh, created 
in such a rush to have Mordecai executed, and that is the end of Haman. So, like we do, uh, every time we're going to now talk about what the application for our life is from the story and the demise of Haman, and we're going to wrap up our study, and the application for Esther chapter 7 is a warning and a blessing. And I want you to think about this chapter in conjunction with Romans chapter 11, and I want to end here uh, because this is such a magnificent passage and is powerful to our understanding of Esther and for all of our lives. And let me read what's called the doxology, uh, and it, it, that declares the glory of God. And Paul writes here in verse 33 to 36, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths are beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So let me read verse 33 once again. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths are beyond tracing out. And as I was studying uh, this chapter and writing it, this verse kind of just stuck in my head. I mean, uh, I mean, we talk about the sovereignty of God. We talk about God ruling and reigning over all things. But in a large degree, we don't really get it. I mean, not in a real practical way where it then affects how we live, how we think, how we act, how we interact with other people, how we uh, go about our days. It really doesn't make an impact on it for, for most of us. And at some level, even though we don't like to think about it or admit it, a lot of us operate more like Haman than we would rather uh, admit. I mean, because that is, we are orchestrating, we're manipulating, we're trying really, really hard to make things work out the way we want them to. And uh, the people and the things that we don't like, well, well we might not construct a 75-foot gallows, but <laughs> to have them executed, right? But you know that there are incidents in your life, and people in your life, that you've tried to get things to work out for you and against them. Right? And we try to move the pieces of our lives around in order to benefit us, to move ourselves toward what we want in life. Let's just be honest about that for a minute, right? We've all done that. And uh, we might say to God, your kingdom come, your will be done. But a lot of times, that's not how we really operate. We're mostly concerned about our kingdom come and our will be done. That's because we don't really understand sovereignty. And we kind of understand it, but we don't trust it. We trust ourselves more. The testimony of Scripture and the clear teaching of Scripture is God knows all things. And you're like, okay, well, duh, Karen, that's Christianity 101, right? I mean, thank you for me showing up here at 6 o'clock on a Wednesday night to learn that, right? But let's think about it a little bit deeper for a minute, what it really means. And the, uh, God knowing all things mean that God knows all big things, all the large things, like the distance between the earth and the next galaxy to the mi millimeter. Um, he knows all big things like the temperature of the surface of the hottest star, the coldest planet, and all those things that we will never, ever, ever see with 10,000 telescopes. He knows every large thing, and he knows every small thing too, like the distance a ladybug can travel in their lifetime, the, uh, the, the diameter of, the, of a flea's a hair on the back of a flea. I um, mean, he knows everything, every single cell in your body and what it does every single day of your entire life. He knows every small thing, and he also knows about all times, right? And Connie was telling me this uh, on Sunday uh, on the way out of church, and I thought this was really good, that the Trinity has never had an emergency meeting. Right? Nothing surprises them. They don't go, oh my goodness, I didn't know that was going to happen. Let's not figure out what's going on. Right? That's not, that's not what happens. He knows all events at all times. Nothing surprises them. And he doesn't just know what happens, but he knows all the people within every event that happens. And all those names in the Old Testament that you go, I don't know how to pronounce that, and why would anybody name their kid that? <laughs> I mean, those are not just names to God. 
Those are people with real hopes and real dreams and real disappointments and real joys. And he knows them all as well as he knows you and every person out to the 10,000th generation if Jesus tarries that long. Intimate, personal knowledge. And the beauty of all of this, it's not just random facts. He rules over it all. Nothing surprises him. Nothing escapes him. Nothing is beyond him. And like the lesson from this week, no one pulls a fast one on God. This is the lesson from Haman. We need to grasp the warning of Haman's life. No secrets are ever kept from God. Ever. This means we need to be really, really careful when we think we're doing things in secret that we think no one knows about. Right? See, mostly we kind of believe as long as we're alone, nobody sees what we're doing, nobody sees what we're looking at online, nobody knows what we're thinking. I don't say it out loud, then it doesn't really matter. And so it's, we've got it hidden. But God knows. God always knows. So be careful when you think you are getting by with doing wrong things and ignoring the commands of God. Because that is never, ever the case. It is a foolish overestimation of our human ability and our intellect to think that anything that we do will circumvent the knowledge of God. It may take a long time. God, in his great mercy, might delay his discipline and call you again over and over and over through his grace again and again and again. But you are not getting away with anything living in disobedience to God. Nothing. And this doesn't mean big things like you might see on the news. This is also small things, right? Little things. Like, I'm not going to forgive that person. I don't have to be kind and compassionate. I'm not going to serve where God wants me to do. Whatever small thing is, if we're in disobedience to God calling us, we're not getting away with anything. So we need to believe in God's sovereignty, submit to his knowledge, Hear the voice of God warning us to pay attention. But to remember uh, that God, uh, the pictures of the Old Testament are principles in the New Testament, okay? Get that. Pictures of the Old Testament, that is the story of Esther, of Abraham, of David, all the people that we read. They are, pick, the pictures are principles of the New Testament. That is, these are the stories are kept and written down for a purpose, and that is to show us God's truth, that and because, you know, a lot of times we can remember a story better than we can remember a doctrine, right? I can, you know, that gets down to our emotions. And it's the same reason that Jesus told parables, right? I mean, he didn't stand up on the Sermon on the Mount and say, get out your piece of paper and write down these five, five points, and they all begin with the letter R, right? <laughs> he told a story. And now those, narrative, those parables that he, he told were, were made up. The narratives in the Old Testament are real people. And their principles drawn out of their lives. And what, and what te Haman teaches us, the New Testament principles that Haman's life teaches us from this chapter is that God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. In Hebrews 4.13, nothing in creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So just dwell on those verses a little bit in conjunction with what we saw in Esther chapter 7 and take a long, sobering look at your life. Is there anything you got tucked in a closet somewhere where uh, you are trying to hide? Don't fool yourself. God sees. God knows. He is patient. He is kind. He is loving. But there is a day coming, just like came for Haman, that everything will be exposed. Now, this is not a message that is warm fuzzy that we like to hear, and you know we'd rather hear a nice one uh, that doesn't disturb us, but these kinds of things are very needed. Today is not only the day of salvation, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, but today is the day for obedience, for righteousness, and holiness for those who do know him as Savior. Okay? Today's lesson from Haman is a warning that stands for us to be sure we are not trifling with God and trying to outmaneuver him. 
This chapter is a, it's also, here's the other side of this lesson, it's, it's a wonderful blessing for those who are committed to uh, following Jesus. Let me tell you that God's knowledge tells us that no faithful servant or quiet commitment to, God, to godliness goes unnoticed either. Think back to last chapter when we saw Mordecai, we talked about him a little bit last time. He's been given this job, right? I mean, he does the work assigned to him. He honors the king. And get this, even when the king is not honorable in himself. You see, he does what is right by exposing the assassination plot where he could have just kept it to himself and hoped for a better ruler. Because if the assassination attempt is, is successful, he's got a new king. Maybe he'll be better than Xerxes. But he doesn't. He honors God. He also honors God by not bowing to Haman when it stirs up a lot of trouble for himself. He gives godly advice to Esther, calling her up to her role in this story. He fasts. He prays. He doesn't let honor and praise when Mordecai, uh, when uh, Haman had to honor him through the streets. He doesn't let that go to his head. He just goes back to his job. And he does all of these things and lives his entire life in exile with no access to the temple. The temple doesn't even exist at this point in history. No access to the scriptures, to priests, to prophets of God. He just chooses to live a life of faithfulness dem that demonstrates his belief and trust in God. And he leaves the consequence of this kind of life in the hands of God. You know what? God pays attention. He does not ignore Mordecai, right? He saved his life right there in chapter 6 in a dramatic turn of events and completely removes the threat of Haman in chapter 7. And we'll see how the rest of this turns out as we move along in the next couple of weeks. But Mordecai didn't do anything to try to manipulate for himself. He prayed, he fasted, he exhorted Esther to step up to the plate, and then he trusted God with the rest of it. Take away it for people who are living in faithfulness is just keep at it. Don't give up. Don't give in. Even though no one may seem to notice and other people may seem to be getting ahead by doing wrong things, God notices. And in the end, he's the only one that matters. Mm -hmm. Let me end, end uh, our lesson for today with this story that was so powerful to me. Um, so I was waiting in a doctor's office not too long ago. And you know your appointment time is just a suggestion, right? <laughs> so in this case, we weren't even in the ballpark. I had sat in that waiting for, for a total of an hour and a half before uh, I was called. And um, you know, uh, and you may not be aware, but there are still magazines in the rack at the doctor's office. I was tired of looking at my phone, so I'm like, I'm going to get a piece of, uh, you know, a, a paper <laughs> magazine here. And what I had to choose from was three: Field and Stream. American cheerleader, I kid you not. I mean, what is that? Is that a thing? <laughs> but apparently so. There's American cheerleader and WebMD magazine. So hoping for uh, you know health tip or two, I picked Web WebMD uh, magazine, and I actually found this pretty interesting arty article about this lady named Gracie Rosenberger, and uh, she was 17 years old when she fell asleep driving her car, and she ran her car into a bridge abutment, and she crushed her legs. And put herself into a coma for three months. <clears throat> so she had about 200 fractures, most in her lower legs, but, uh, but the surgeons were actually able to save her legs and she was able to regain uh, um, and learn to walk again, but it was not without constant pain. And in fact, the longer she went after the surgeries and everything, the worse the pain got instead of it getting better. And so she had to eventually come to the, uh, the agonizing decision to have her, uh, both her legs below the knee amputated. And so uh, instead of it being, she being sidelined by her disability, she actually turned it into a uh, opportunity to encourage veterans and, and people in war-torn countries about how they can live a full life with prosthetics. So, but it was an inspiring story in herself, in itself, but this is why I was at this Thing and it took so long for this quote right here. She said this, she said, some things in our lives become so badly damaged, it cripples us to keep them. Think about that. Some things in our lives become so badly damaged, it cripples us to keep them. And uh, I'm sure that she was talking in a more literal sense here, 
because uh, it's nothing about her being a Christian or anything, but I was just gripped by this idea. And, and I know, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that, that this is true for believers, both spiritually and emotionally. And now, in Mark chapter 9, Jesus says something similar that sounds extreme and confusing at first. He says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. Verse 45 says, if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet be thrown into hell. Now, obviously, Jesus is not speaking literally here. He's not saying that your eternal life is in jeopardy when you sin either. If you are saved, that is forever. So don't take that from there. He, no, there uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None zero, nada, nothing. Salvation is permanent. But what he is saying here, Jesus exhorts us to be radical in dealing with sin. Okay, sometimes we allow, we invite things into our lives, relationships, material pre uh, possessions, coping mechanisms that seem to us as critically as important as a hand or a foot, right? But deep down, they are contrary to a life of faith. Now, we can read what the Bible says, hear what people have to say to us, but often we go and we rationalize our dependence on these things in our lives, supposing that we'll be crippled without them, supposingly that we, will, we can't function without them, without them. But her quote has powerful spiritual application. We need to realize that our determination to hold on to these things and hold on to sin is what is that disables us from the fullness that God intends for our lives. So, what are you holding on to that seems critical, but is actually crippling you from becoming what God intends? Is it unbelief? Is it resistance to his initial call on your life to be saved? I mean, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to hear his voice and respond if he is calling you if you've never made a relate you have never made a commitment to Christ and become a Christian then uh, the time is short don't wait to trust Christ as savior please do it today talk to the person at your table the group leader they will help you if you have questions but if you are a Christian time is also short for you too hear the ad admonition of Esther chapter 7 don't be fooled and live in deception like Haman. Open up your life to Jesus. All of it. Don't say, I'm too old or it's too late. Did you know that God called a uh, Moses to his greatest level of service at the end part of his life? Or don't say, I'm too young either. That's not an excuse either. Or, oh, I'll do that later when I'm off further on in my life. God called Samuel to lifelong service when he was about five years old. Make the commitment to radical obedience to Christ right now. Whatever needs to go, get rid of it. If it needs to be added something, add it. Uh, it might be that you need to change the way you think about God, the way you think about Christ, the way you think about yourself. As we bring those things in our, in, our, in our mind, in alignment with the scriptures, we'll start to see change happen. Don't be like Wyatt Wiley Coyote from the beginning of our lesson, right? Who pursued his obsession, his desire, right off a cliff and never realized he was in danger. Oh, it's too late. You can stop anytime. You can change direction anytime. Change pursuits. And it begins with commitment and determination and action. Because your commitment to obedience is where you begin to find the fullness your heart truly desires. Remember the warning from Haman. Remember the blessing from Mordecai. God sees. God knows. Hear his voice. Commit to follow. He will never, ever. Be sorry. Amen? God, we just thank you that um, you don't just uh, pat us on the head and say everything's all right, but we need to hear hard things. And God, if there's somebody here tonight who has been putting things in a closet and kind of pushing the door shut, that God, I would just pray.
pray that you would give them the courage, give them the nudge of your Holy Spirit to open up that closet and deal with whatever's in there. And I, got, I pray, God, that for those who are faithfully following you, who are discouraged today because it seems like nobody's paying attention, seems like that, that everybody is getting ahead and that a life of obedience to you is just hard. I pray you'd encourage them too and remind them that you see, that you are paying attention and that you will reward them for their faithful service. We pray this in the strong name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> All right, let's break to groups and uh